I'm very, very excited to introduce Monica Bass to all of you. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to know her over the past uh, eight or so months in the journey class, and it has been uh, such a pleasure, um, such a wonderful spirit and soul, and um, her story is, is, we need to hear it, right? We need to hear each other's stories so we can connect, um, connect to each other and also better understand the way God works in our lives. Uh, the journey class is all about answering three questions. Who am I? Who is God? And what does God want to do with my life? And I think you will see in Monica's story that um, again and again, God told her who she is, he told her who he is, and he's also made clear to her um, what he wants to do in her life. So I'm excited to turn it over to you. Okay. Thank you. Well, good morning. good morning. It truly is a blessing for me to be here, and I'm truly humbled. Um, my prayer is that you are able to better see God in your life by hearing how he has worked in mine. November of 1982, I was born Monica Renee Gilau to Jonathan in Virginia. I was their first child and we lived in Denver, Iowa, where my grandpa Tony grew up and called home his entire life. I am very proud to be a Gilau. Since the day I was born, my dad was usually drunk or high on drugs. He worked at John Deere and was paid based upon the amount of parts that he produced, and he quickly found that if he took speed at work, he made a bunch of parts, which made him a bunch of money too. He would drink at night to counteract the narcotics in his system and to help him relax. He was addicted to drugs and alcohol. My mom stayed with him until she found drugs in our trailer in Denver. She had just had my younger brother, and we were leaving. He was in my life until I was two, and I only have a couple memories of him. As a radical attempt that he made to get sober, he enlisted in the Navy and left for San Diego. He went AWOL not long after, and the rest is pretty much history. Drugs and alcohol ruined my dad. They ruined my relationship with my dad. And although I didn't grow up with him, his parents, my grandparents, Tony and Bonnie, were always there for me my entire life, and I love them very much. My mom remarried when I was five. She married Dave Bass in 1987, who at the time was a police officer in Cedar Falls and also a recovering alcoholic. I remember breakfast the first morning we stayed at his apartment. He asked me what kind of oatmeal I wanted, and I told him that I did not like oatmeal. And he said, well, I didn't ask you if you liked it. I asked you what kind you wanted. <laughs> We can laugh about it now, but that is a prime example of life in his house. He was in charge both on the streets and in the home. And despite our clashing personalities, he is the one I call my dad today. Shortly after my parents were married, they were out on a date and I was sexually abused by a 15-year-old babysitter. I was five and he told me not to tell anyone. I do still have those memories, but I did end up telling a trusted adult and it didn't happen again. We started going to Trinity Wesleyan Church in Cedar Falls and then Sunnyside Temple. I was eight years old or so at the time and I enjoyed Sunday school and Wednesday night church with friends. This would be the first time that I was really learning and understanding Jesus. My parents were hooked on God and I started noticing some big changes in our home. Santa Claus was now referred to as Satan Claus. Unwanted behavior resulted in Bible readings and papers over what we read. And as I got older, it was made clear that there was no dancing, no dating, no alcohol, no secular music, no, no, no. Life seemed to get stricter the closer to God my parents got. And as I became a teenager, I would question about how close to God I really wanted to be. In 1993, my dad went on a missions trip to Mongolia for three months. If you don't know where Mongolia is, or if you have never heard of the country, you're not alone. Here's a map, and it's the center one kind of landlocked between Russia and China. This trip would turn into a passion for my parents for the next 25 years, and it took our entire family to Mongolia in 1996. This was a major event in my life, and it did not play out the same way for me as it did for my parents. My parents were now missionaries, Volunteers following God's call in their lives to bring Jesus to a country that hadn't even heard the name Jesus before. 
Many Mongolians thought Jesus was simply a man in America. But for me, I was an angry 15-year-old being taken away from friends and all the things that high schoolers look forward to. I made sure it was clear to my parents that I was not happy. And my parents would say that God's call to them was God's call to the family. But at that time, I did not want to be a part of God's call. My family was on a furlough back home in the United States, and I told myself that there was no way that I was going back to Mongolia. I ran away from home and lived with a friend. Looking back, I think my parents were just as lost and confused as I was. They were doing what they thought was right, and I know that. It was just a very difficult time for all of us. My family did go back to Mongolia without me, and I was a 17-year-old alone now with absolutely no restrictions. And I knew that I did not want to go to church. I was mad at God, I was mad at my parents, and I felt lost and was hurting pretty badly. In 1999, I started my first job at a Burger King in Waterloo. I worked full time and was making friends with the employees there. When I came back from Mongolia, it was very strange for me to see how life had simply gone on while I was gone, and I really didn't know where I belonged. I didn't drink, I didn't party, and I don't do drugs. I did, though, start getting a lot of attention from guys, which was brand new to me. With an apartment of my own, no rules, restrictions, or direction, I was doing whatever I wanted. I was young and naive, and I craved love and attention from anyone that would give it to me. But unfortunately, I wasn't getting that attention from the best of places. I became pregnant at 18, 21, and 23. God gave me my Olivia, Daniel, and Andrew. My precious, precious babies. I didn't have a lot, but I had a lot of love to give them. And at that time, that is all that mattered to me. In 2007, my kids were six, three, and one, and I was working at the Target Distribution Center, but barely getting by. Our kitchen table was a moving box turned upside down, our fridge was mostly bare, and we didn't have any furniture aside from a bed for everyone. I vividly remember having a moment with God where I cried my heart out to him. I told him my children deserved more than this, but I didn't know what to do or how to change anything. I had this strong feeling that I wanted to be a better role model for them so that they could grow up and hopefully make better choices than I did. Even though I had turned my back on him so many years before, he heard my cries. He started opening doors for me, and instead of passing them by, I decided to trust him, really trust him, and walked through them instead. This was a huge step of faith for me, and ultimately was life-changing for all of us. After nine years of not going to church, I felt like I wanted to start going again. I asked my friend Jenny Matthews if she knew of a church for us to go to, and she told us to try Orchard Hill, so we did. God was working in my life and heart in so many ways during this time. I felt like I needed to let go of things in my life that were weighing down my heart. I had guilt, shame, anger, and regrets that I laid out to God. This is also when I was able to, able to forgive my abuser. Even though I would periodically think about the abuse that I experienced as a young child, I was able to forgive the man who did that to me, and I give God the credit. It took me some time, but I realized that my Heavenly Father has forgiven me, and I needed to forgive Him. And I can honestly tell you that as soon as I gave God that pain, He removed it from my heart. And it allowed love and kindness to replace the hurt. Mark 11:25 says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive, so that your Father who is in heaven may forgive you. I can't explain the amount of anger and resentment I had toward my parents that I needed to turn into forgiveness as well. Even though I never formally told them that I forgave them, I did it in my heart, and that was enough. I can't explain the supernatural feelings I felt by letting go of years of emotional pain that I was hanging on to, not just from my upbringing and family, but from my choices too. Every family is different, and forgiving someone looks different to each one of us. But I challenge you to give God that pain that you've been holding on to caused by someone's wrongdoing. I would have never thought that I could forgive some people in my life and not think about it all the time, not hold resentments towards them, and not be angered toward them. But it's true. God lifted a heavy weight from me when I started forgiving people. 
and he wants to do the same for you. During this time, I also reached out to my biological dad, and I spoke with him over the phone a few times. I hadn't seen or spoken to him in 32 years. It was very important to me that he knew that I'd forgiven him as well. I told him I forgave him for not being in my life and that I loved him. He started crying and told me how sorry he was for his choices. And that he had made, and that not only has his, had his addictions ruined relationships with his kids and family, but they were killing him as well. He was dying, and it was evident how alcohol can affect someone physically. He recently passed away, but I am so happy that I got to tell him those things before he died. The devil was also working overtime in my life during this time. I started having terrifying dreams of demons floating above me in my bed and throwing pitchforks and daggers at me. It felt so real, and I would hide under my blankets in fear. I had feelings of not being worthy enough, Christian enough, or perfect enough to go to church, to be a mom, you name it, I felt it. My mom would always pray and reassure me that the thoughts were directly from Satan that, and that he had no power over me. I know my parents prayed for me and my babies a lot, and I'm so thankful for them for their prayers. They helped me put those lies that Satan was telling me to rest. In 2008, I enrolled at Hawkeye Community College. Now, college was not talked about or expected growing up, so I really didn't know what I was doing. I had attempted college when I was 17, but I stopped going mid-semester, and I didn't know exactly what to do, but I did see how other parents were living in jobs that they had, and they went to college, so that's where I started. I remember being afraid when I went on campus to talk to someone about it, because I didn't know how I was gonna pay for anything, and I thought that they would want money right away. They walked me through the steps, and I cried when I got the acceptance letter in the mail a few days later. At 26 years old with three little kids, I was going to college, and that was the first time that I remember being proud of myself. I graduated from Hawkeye, and it had to have been God saying, you have come this far, but you have to keep going. So I did. I applied at UNI, and this time I truly thought I wasn't gonna be accepted. This was you and I, and in my mind, that was such a prestigious place. So just imagine my disbelief when I got accepted there as well. I started my degree in elementary ed in the fall of 2009, and I graduated three years later with a bachelor's degree in education. I did it. We did it, because my kids were there with me every step of the way. They celebrated my accomplishments with me and were always showing me grace and love when I was stressed. And there were some very tough times. Countless mornings waking up at 2 a.m. to do homework until the kids woke up, because doing homework with little ones around was nearly impossible. They were also my little guinea pigs with lessons I would plan and then test out with them. To this day, those years were some tough years, but they were also the most memorable to me so far. So much love was between the walls of our two-bedroom apartment on Maplewood Drive, and so many beautiful memories were made with my sweet babies during those years. Banana pancakes, frozen grapes, a two-year-old trying to make popcorn at 4 a.m., duct taping cupboards and a refrigerator shut to keep little boys out, family nap time, afternoons at the pool, walks to school with a two-year-old in his troller. I am so thankful for these times. Instead of being a classroom teacher, I got a job at UNI as an educational counselor. My job was to be an advocate for education to people who had given up on theirs, who didn't know how to enroll, or who didn't have the support. I felt like God had made this job just for me, and I was able to empathize with others who were in similar shoes as I was in previous years. I had a good salary, great benefits, and I felt like I was slowly building a life for me and my kids that I could be proud of. While I was working on my degree, I ran into a man that I had dated years earlier. We began dating again, and he had a job where he traveled around the country and the world for work, but we talked constantly. He would fly me to meet him wherever he was a few times a year, and he would be home in Waterloo for brief amounts of time, so our relationship consisted mostly of texting and calling. A couple of years later, he wasn't traveling as much, 
and was home a lot more. We didn't live together, but I wanted to marry him and I cared about him very much. Since he was home more now and we were spending time together, I began noticing some inconsistencies, red flags, and questionable behavior in our relationship. But he would always have just the right words to say, and I would shrug it off and agree that things were just as, I, as he said, all in my head. But there came a time when there was no more denying that the things I had questioned, wondered, and felt were indeed legitimate. I wasn't the only woman in his life. This hit me hard, and I was devastated. I was saddened for my children, I was saddened for me, and I was saddened for the future I had been dreaming about with him. It was hard, but I forgave him for the wrongs that he had done, and I truly believed him when he said he was sorry. As time went on, instead of feeling secure and loved in the relationship, I usually had more questions than answers, and his words didn't soothe me like they had always before. He had just the right words to say at all times, but his actions spoke much louder. I started questioning him, calling him out, and holding him accountable for his behavior, and this caused tempers that I hadn't seen before, including slamming cupboards, punching walls, throwing things, and a lot of drinking. The verbal and emotional abuse got really bad. It was made clear that I was the reason why he would do these things, and that if I would only act better or let him do whatever he wanted, then he wouldn't behave this way. To keep the peace and to keep this relationship together, I gave in and worked relentlessly hard to do whatever I could to not upset him. I felt like I had come so far from where I was and I was very scared to fail. My kids and I walked on eggshells every day to make sure he didn't get upset. It was a miserable way to live. He never once hit me, so I felt like I wasn't being abused, but he was hurting me and he was hurting my kids. I was certain that if I worked harder at being, a, at being better in his eyes, then he would stop the abuse. I stopped going to Orchard for a year or so during this time. I would get guilt trips if I did something for me and the kids that didn't benefit him. Everything had to be of benefit for him. This was emotionally tiring. I would cry my eyes out on my bathroom floor in the fetal position. I started having panic attacks. And it got so bad a few times, I even thought about driving my car into a cement barrier because I couldn't handle the pain that his hurtful words were causing me. The only reason why I never did that was because of my sweet babies. So many lonely nights, I would lie in bed silently crying, asking Jesus to hold me so I could fall asleep, and he did. It was so comfort comforting knowing that Jesus was right there with me, even when I felt like my life was falling apart. Knowing that he was there through everything helped calm my heart at times, it saved my life, and God gave me strength to carry on and the courage to finally break free. The final straw was after his second OWI. He drove drunk to my house while four or five state troopers were blaring their sirens behind him for a mile or two. He called me on his way and told me to go outside. I had no idea what was going on when I walked outside and saw him with his hands up and a trooper with his gun drawn. He was able to talk to me for a second before he was taken away. He started rubbing my shoulders and told me that this was my fault because I made him drink and that I was paying the costs for everything that would come out of this incident. That was it. I knew for sure that I wasn't crazy anymore and I needed my family away from this man. I went to bed that night fully knowing that this relationship was over and I needed to talk with a professional to help me plan my next steps. I met with a counselor a week later who told me right away that we needed to create an exit plan. As much as I wanted to just up and leave, I was afraid of him, and I felt like if any changes were gonna be made, they were gonna have to be made on his terms, not mine. So I decided I was going to take a few months and slowly start putting some distance between us. When he would leave and not come home, I let it be. When he left town, I didn't ask questions, and I was starting to get my life and freedom back, and it felt absolutely amazing. He wasn't regularly staying with us, and we really didn't see much of him anymore, and our home was so much happier. He still wasn't completely letting go of this tight grip that he had on me for so long, but it was doable for now, and life was so much better than it had been. 
A few months later, I was at my office at UNI when a Waterloo police officer came in looking for me. My ex had keyed my car a few, day, a few days earlier, so I thought that the officer was there to pick up my damage estimates to put on file. I handed him the estimates, and he looked puzzled. I asked him if he was here to pick them up, and he said he wasn't, but he needed to talk with me and that we should probably go outside. Now I was confused. He said the name of my ex and asked me if I knew who he was. I nodded, and he said, I don't know how to tell you this, but your life is in danger. He has put a hit out on you, and you need to come with me now. I started crying. I knelt down to the ground with my face in my hands and just bawled. I knew he could do this. I secretly, deep down inside, knew that he was capable of this behavior, and I was very afraid. I was told that my ex had conspired with a man at the Isle of Capri to hire someone to hurt me and possibly kill me a week or so earlier. This conversation was overheard by table dealers and they reported it to the police. No one knew who I was, and if it hadn't been for him keying my car a few days earlier, I don't know if they would have been able to figure out who I was and put the pieces together soon enough. The police helped me get a no-contact order immediately. I was told not to return to our home because they weren't sure who all he was collaborating with to hurt me. What was I going to tell my kids? I couldn't tell them the truth, so I came up with some lousy lies about why we had to leave our home. I sheltered my kids from everything, and I guess this is the only thing I know to do sometimes to make sure that they're okay. They had no idea what was going on because I didn't want them to worry. The man my ex solicited to hurt me to hurt me died in a suspicious fire three months before trial. The videotapes that were requested by the investigator showing the two men talking were date stamped wrong, so the, evi so the video couldn't be submitted as evidence. The jury said they didn't have enough evidence beyond a reasonable doubt for a conviction, so according to the law, he was found not guilty. He did go to jail for six months, though, because he ripped off his ankle monitor and was still abusing alcohol. I got to see firsthand how unjust life can be. Okay, God, so what now? The kids and I didn't have our home. I was too afraid to continue at UNI with him knowing my every move and my daily routine, so I lost a great job there. I was constantly looking over my shoulder in fear. There ultimately came a time where I couldn't hide it anymore from my kids. What made them sad the most was that I might be hurt and not be here for them. And that was deeply painful for me as well. Fear takes a hold of us, and it definitely had a strong hold on me. I was sorely afraid. In Isaiah 41.10, Jesus tells us, Do not be afraid, for I am with you always. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my righteous right hand. Picturing God holding me up was very impactful. Was I going to rely on myself to calm my heart and my fears, or was I gonna trust God with my life, fully knowing that he is God, he is powerful, and there is nothing that is too difficult for him? We have an amazing God. Even though the kids and I were very much the victims, and this wasn't my fault, it was my responsibility to put our lives back together, but not where I wanted them, where God wants, wanted them. It was during this time that God opened up more doors, and it was my choice what I wanted to do. I walked through the door, and I had no idea what that meant, but he has shown me over and over the past three years how loved and treasured and cared for I am. Blessing after blessing to a person who didn't deserve it, I turned my back on him so many times, but he loved me anyway. I was the thorn in his crown, the sweat from his brow, the nail in his wrist. I turned away with sin in my heart, and I tried to bury his grace. And then alone in the night, I still called out to him, and he was there. He picked me up and wrapped me in his arms and has shown me an indescribable amount of love, grace, forgiveness, compassion, and I have been blown away with everything that he has done that there is no way I could ever deny him in his power. I give God the glory for everything in my life. I am, in, I am incredibly thankful for his healing power as well because I don't have bitterness or hate or regret in my heart. Today, 
Life in my house is much better. I continue to be blessed being a mom to my amazing kids, and I absolutely love being a mom. I love getting to see how God is working in their hearts and lives. I also met an incredible man, Charlie. Charlie is loving, kind, gentle, compassionate, funny, and patient, and he loves my kids like they're his own. His family has welcomed us into their hearts and home, and they had absolutely no idea what we had been through, but they loved us, and me and my kids needed that. I'm excited to say that we're getting married soon. I am redeemed and remarkably blessed. The first two verses of Romans 5 speak to me about how God, how God opens doors and makes us whole with him. By entering through faith into what God has always wanted to do for us, sets us right with him, makes us fit for him. We have it all together with God because of our master Jesus. And that's not all. We throw open our doors to God and discover at the same moment that he has already thrown open his doors to us. We find ourselves standing where we always hoped we might stand, out in the wide open spaces of God's grace and glory, standing tall and shouting our praise. God doesn't tell us that life will be perfect. He is perfect, but we are not. He does tell us that he is with us and that we are never alone. God will go before you, walk beside you, stand behind you, and is always with you. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. There is a song by Amy Grant called My Father's Eyes. When I was young, I would sing it in my room and think of my biological dad. The dad I didn't know, the one who wasn't around, the one who never called, the one I made up in my mind from the couple of sweet memories I had of him. The song refers to having the eyes of Jesus, but in my young mind, to me it meant having the same eyes as my dad. Part of the song goes, if I can have just one wish I pray, when people look inside my life, I want to hear them say, she's got her father's eyes. 30 years later, this song is still very special to me. Only now, when people look inside my eyes, I hope they see the eyes of our Heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you yes. um, for sharing. And let's pray. Uh, dear God, oh, we lift up Monica right now for her courage and her testament of all that you are and all that she is through you. Um, I just am so thankful for the ways in which you kept opening doors so that you could be revealed to her. And I'm so thankful that she responded and that she walked towards you when she needed you. Um, I pray for all of us here that we can remember that we can come before God with all that we are and all that we've been through and all the ways that we feel like we're not enough or not perfect or um, not worthy. And I pray that as a church family, we, we share with each other and we reveal ourselves to each other because there's such tremendous power in that. Um, and there's um, just incredible learning that we uh, can have from knowing you when we hear of other people's stories. So thank you for Monica. Bless her. Bless her life. Bless her family's life. Thank you for placing into her life a family that uh, sticks together and loves each other and um, serve God together and pursue God together. And also thank you for uh, Charlie and their upcoming marriage and just bless that. Bless their, their marriage and their family together. I pray all this in your name. Amen.